Hi everyone, in this lecture we'll be talking about membrane transport, specifically about how different substances cross the cell membrane. First, let's take a look at the role of membrane proteins in the transport of various solutes. So these membrane proteins, which account for almost 50% of the mass of the cell membrane, act as passages for our different solutes. In this figure, you can see an example of a protein-free artificial lipid bilayer, also known as a liposome. In this example, you can see that there are no proteins, and at the same time, you can also see that there is hardly any transfer of different solutes from the inside to the outside of the cell and vice versa. However, when we have our different membrane proteins, all of a sudden, transfer of solutes is now possible. So first, you have bidirectional transport of these solutes. You can also have export and import of these solutes. Next, let's talk about the different permeability properties of solutes. First, you have your small nonpolar molecules. These are commonly gases which do not have any charges. So these types of molecules, since they are very small, have a very easy time passing through our lipid bilayer. And in fact, they are thought to dissolve readily into our lipid bilayer. Another compound that can easily pass through the lipid bilayer are steroid hormones. So although these are bigger than our gases, these types of molecules are lipophilic. This means that they can easily pass through our different lipids in the bilayer. Next, we have our uncharged polar molecules. These types of molecules diffuse readily into the cell membrane, but it depends on these molecule size. So for example, we have small uncharged polar molecules like water, ethanol, and glycerol. These can easily diffuse through the cell membrane as long as they've used the concentration gradient. However, you have larger molecules like amino acids, glucose, and nucleosides, and these have a very hard time in passing through our cell membrane. So you need the help of various proteins in order to facilitate their transfer. And then finally, you have your charged molecules or ions. And these are molecules that cannot pass through the cell membrane. This means that the cell membrane is impermeable to these different ions. So because these ions cannot pass through, eventually what you are left with is varying concentrations of these ions inside the cell and outside the cell. So here you can see the different concentrations of the major cations or positively charged ions inside the cell and outside the cell. Inside the cell, you can find that there is a very high concentration of potassium ions and outside the cell, we find a very high concentration of sodium ions. So here are also other different cations with varying concentrations in and out of the cell. Meanwhile, for anions or negatively charged ions, the major extracellular anion is chlorine. Inside the cell, there are a few chlorine ions, but most of the negative charges or negatively charged molecules inside the cell are actually the different components of the cell, like your amino acids and your nucleic acids. So because of this differing concentration, our cell membrane has what we call membrane potential. So this is the voltage difference across the cell membrane caused by an imbalance of charged molecules. And you can see here that the resting membrane potential or the normal membrane potential of our cell is around negative 20 to negative 200 millivolts. And this is because the interior of the cell is actually more negatively charged than the exterior. And this is because of all the negatively charged molecules that we discussed in the previous slide. Now, the membrane potential can be used for two things. First, you have the transport of certain metabolites. Because the membrane potential is a voltage difference, the transport of molecules along this membrane potential actually produces energy, and this can be used later on in the transport of certain metabolites. Next, you have cell-to-cell -cell communication, as in the case of your different neurons that fire electrical signals from one cell to another. So next, let's talk about the different types of transport. But before that, we first have to talk about concentration gradients.
Now in chemistry, we learned that when a substance is concentrated in one area, they tend to move or diffuse outward to less concentrated areas. And the same is also true in our cell. So now we have two types of transport. The first one is passive transport. And this type of transport transfers molecules from very concentrated areas to less concentrated areas. In other words, it transports molecules along the concentration gradient. So because these molecules naturally move in this direction, then passive transport does not require extra energy on the part of the cell. And there are two types of passive transport proteins. We call them our channels and our transporters. On the other hand, you also have active transport, which moves molecules against their concentration gradient. In other words, from less concentrated areas to more concentrated areas. And since molecules normally do not move this way, the cell has to expend energy in order to pump out these types of molecules. That's why the active transport proteins are called pumps. All right, we'll now focus more on our passive transport. But first, let's talk about the electrochemical gradient. This is actually the net driving force of passive transport. So in the previous slide, we talked about the concentration gradient, but we must also not forget that our cell membranes have membrane potential. The outside is positively charged and the inside is negatively charged. So these two now come into play when we talk about our passive transport. So let's take this first example. Here is a figure showing the transport of positively charged molecules from a high concentration to a low concentration. So in this case, there are actually two things working for this transport. First, these molecules are passing through or going along the concentration gradient from more concentrated to less concentrated. But at the same time, since they are positively charged molecules, they will be easily attracted to the negatively charged molecules inside the cell membrane. So here, there is a very fast movement of these molecules. On the other hand, you can see a concentration gradient that is working along the gradient for these molecules. So from high concentration, we want to transfer these positively charged molecules to a lower concentration. However, the outside of the cell is positively charged. So this molecule, even though it follows the concentration gradient, will still have a hard time because it is going against the membrane potential of this cell. Next, let's talk about the different classes of passive transport proteins that we have. We have our channels and our transporters. First, for channels, these are proteins that essentially have a hole or a passageway in the middle wherein different solutes can pass through. However, these solutes or molecules need to follow certain criteria and these are your size and electrical charge. So first, they have to be physically small enough. Their size has to fit through the gap or the hole in the channel. And secondly, they must have the proper electrical charge to be able to pass through. So for example, if the protein has a channel that is negatively charged, then only positively charged molecules can pass through. We should also note that the channel is non-selective. This means that as long as the molecule fits the two criteria needed, they will be able to pass through this channel. In contrast, we also have transporters, and these use active binding sites instead of holes. So binding sites are very specific to only certain compounds. So for example, in this figure, the solute binding site has to have a solute that attaches to it, and the solute has to be the right fit for this binding site. When that happens, the transporter changes its shape or its conformation in order to allow the solute to pass through. So because it uses the solute binding site, this type of protein is highly selective for the different compounds which it allows to pass through the cell membrane. In this figure, you can see a better look at one of our transporters. This is a glucose transporter. So here you can see the glucose, and this is actually very specific for the D-glucose isomer of glucose. So the D-glucose 
attaches to the glucose transporter and the glucose binding site. And when this happens, the protein changes its shape, it closes up, and it opens back into the cytosol. So in that case, the glucose can then enter the cell. Once the glucose has left, the protein can then reverse back its shape in order to allow another glucose molecule to bind and enter the cell. So in other words, the passive transporter allows for the transfer of only one molecule of a solute at a time. Next, let's talk about our channels. And the main one that we can find in many cells are the different ion channels. So as you mentioned last time, the ion channel is non-selective. So as long as the compound is able to fit the different criteria of the channel, it can pass through. So our channels, especially our ion channels, have a few characteristics. First, they have ion selectivity, and they are also gated. Now for ion selectivity, this is what we were mentioning earlier, in which only compounds with certain charges can pass through the ion channel. And this is because in a part of the ion channel, it actually narrows down to a very, very small point. And the purpose of this is to remove any water molecules that might be attached to certain ions. Because normally, ions do not just exist in their ionic form. They have to be combined with other molecules. So once it reaches this uh, filter, it's called the selectivity filter, then the charge of the ion is exposed. And as long as it fits the charge of the ion channel, it will be able to pass through this channel. Next, it is also gated. Now, if the channel was just constantly open, then there would be an abundance of ions that pass through this channel. So in order to prevent that, the ion channel also has a gate that closes and opens the ion channel, sometimes randomly, but sometimes also through a variety of different stimuli. So in this way, as long as the gate is open, ions can still pass through. But when the gate is closed, no ions can pass through. So they have to wait until the gate opens again. All right, now let's talk about active transport pumps. So again, these are proteins that transport solutes against its electrochemical gradient. So in other words, from low concentration to high concentration. So because of this, because it's going against the electrochemical gradient, these types of proteins need to use energy in order to transfer their molecule of interest. And here we have three different pumps, all with three different types of energy sources. The first one is the gradient-driven pump, which relies on the energy of the electrochemical gradient to transfer certain molecules. Next, you also have your ATP-driven pump, which uses energy from the breakdown of ATP and also light-driven pumps, which instead use solar energy to transfer solutes against the electrochemical gradient. So light-driven pumps are only found in plant cells and other photosynthetic cells. But for animal cells, we both have your gradient-driven pumps and your ATP-driven pumps. So here, let's talk more about our gradient-driven pumps. We have two types. We call this the symport and the antiport. So for the symport, this actually transports two molecules in the same direction. So one molecule is the one following the electrochemical gradient, and this is the molecule that produces energy as it passes through the pump. At the same time, the energy that, being, that is being produced by this molecule is used by the protein in order to co-transport another molecule. This time, this molecule is the one going against the electrochemical gradient. So they are going in the same direction. For your antiport, you have one transported molecule along the concentration gradient. By the way, the other term for along the concentration gradient is downhill. So this molecule is following downhill transport, and the energy being produced by the transport of this molecule is then used to transport the other molecule against the concentration gradient or uphill. So this molecule is being transported 
uphill. So here you have two molecules going in different directions. Meanwhile, you also have a uniport, but these aren't really considered pumps because only one type of molecule is being transported. And usually this molecule is going with the electrochemical gradient. Now let's have some examples of transport proteins in animal cells. First, we'll talk about aquaporins, and these are channel proteins which are used for the transport of water. In the previous slide, we talked about water and how it is a small polar molecule. As it is very small, it can actually pass through the cell membrane, but it does so at a slow rate. So in times or in cases where the cell needs a lot of water, they make use of our aquaporins. So they move water from the outside where we can find a high water concentration and a low solute concentration to the inside of the cell where we see high solute and low water concentration. In other words, water goes along the electrochemical gradient from the outside to the inside of the cell. Now here is a figure representing the structure of our aquaporin it's actually a complex of four proteins and here you can see the different water molecules passing through those four aquaporin proteins now if we just allowed water to keep on entering the cell eventually it would burst so our cells have found ways to combat osmotic swelling in some eukaryotic cells, like your protozoans, they use a discharging contractile vacuole. So this is a compartment inside the cell where they store water. And once the cell has detected that it is about to burst, then it expels that water into its environment. Meanwhile, you also have plant cells. Now our plant cells, they have a very thick and a very strong cell wall around the cell. So they are very resistant to osmotic pressure. So in the case of the plant cell, it just allows water to keep going inside its cell because anyway, it has a very strong cell wall to protect it from bursting. Now for animal cells, instead of expelling the water directly, what they do is they release ions outward into the extracellular space. And along with these ions, water will just naturally flow out of the cell as well. So you can see that there are a variety of different ways that various cells have used to, to combat your osmotic swelling. Next, let's talk about the glucose sodium ion symport. So this is used for the transport of both sodium and glucose. So here you can see that in the extracellular space, you see an abundance of sodium ions. So this means that the electrochemical gradient for your sodium ions goes from outside of the cell to the inside of the cell. Meanwhile, you also have glucose on this other end, and glucose actually has a higher concentration inside the cell rather than outside. So now we would like to transfer glucose inside the cell. In other words, we want to transport glucose against its electrochemical gradient or uphill. So in this case, we would be using a symport. So here you can see that the symport has two binding sites, one for your sodium ion and the other one for your glucose. Now, when the sodium ion attaches and the glucose attaches, the protein uses the energy from the sodium ion, which is going along or downhill its electrochemical gradient, in order to change its shape and open inwardly, releasing both molecules. So in this case, the two molecules are being transported together. This is why we call this a symport. So once the protein has become empty, it will go back to its closed position and open up ready for another sodium and another glucose ion to attach. Okay, so that ends our lecture. If you would like to learn more about the things we discussed, please make sure to check out these different references. Thank you very much, and we hope to see you in the next video.